Sometimes we, we wait for a gift from a loved one or such as if it's an anniversary. I'm just trying to make sure my wife's prepared that we won't, I won't get her anything today. Not just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, <clears throat> and we receive that gift and we're excited about it. We open up the box of chocolates and we eat it all. We gained a few pounds. Now, there are people in this world who don't feel loved. They don't feel that people love them or people care about them. And we have to tell them as a church that God loves them. And we read here in Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39, which I'll focus more on 38 and 39, some things and truths that we can understand about God's love or the love of Christ that he has for us. You know, in June, June 30th, 2011, was said to be a beautiful day. It was so pretty that uh, one of the tourists in the nation's capital said, God kissed it with his love. There was not a cloud in the sky. The air was clean and the sun did not just shine. On the 30th, it smiled. The warm embrace of a summer day brought thousands of tourists to the district. The sun would soon set and Washington, D.C.'s nightlife would wake up like a newborn baby ready to stay up and play for the rest of the evening. There was a huge private party on a rooftop of the W Hotel. By 10 p.m., it bore the party uh, noise and uh, uh, that was vibrant and a social event filled with prosperous people who uh, were having a great time. By 11 p.m., the entire scene would take a horrific turn for the worst. A woman's body lay covered with a white sheet near the front of the hotel. One report from the rooftop was that she had walked over to the fence, climbed over the the fence, and and, uh, stepped off the edge to her death. The scene was roped off uh, like in CSI fashion. D.C. police were everywhere, and enough substantiated reports from the crowd were were that the woman had just told her friend that no one loved her, not even God. Such a death is a painful proof that people still do not understand the fact that God's love is real. More importantly, as a reminder to the Christian church that our message to the world is simple and it needs to be proclaimed and repeated. God loves you. God loves you. And we are not to be ashamed to tell them about that love, the love of the gospel of Jesus Christ, went to the cross, buried, resurrected on the third day. God had a rescue uh, plan, and he would go through that rescue plan through Jesus Christ. God loves you. Well, people hear that word, that God loves you, and they get in their mind of, how can God love me if I'm a sinner? How can God love me if I'm the worst of the worst, if I'm a drug addict, a drunkard, or again, whatever I am? How can God love me in a world that we live in? You know, as a church, we're to proclaim that. Paul makes it clear that he himself is bold for the sake of the gospel. He says in Romans 1.1.6, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first to Jew first, to Jew first and then also the, for the Greek. He says that the depravity of the human humanity is... Our problem in Romans 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then he goes on and says that the redemptive plan of God is to save us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Romans 6, 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he goes on and says, and that's God's love and that God's love for us is real and will never fade nor change. Romans chapter five, eight, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ 
died for us. And that's the message that we need to proclaim to the world, that Jesus Christ loves them. God loves them so much that he went to the cross for them. God loves them so much, no matter if they're ugly on the outside, God loves them totally. You know, the words of Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39 I replete and clear to, to this fact. For Paul wrote, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor death nor other or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that something? That is the word of God. That God loves us. You know, we get some examples in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39. If we went back to 35, that's fine. We could get the same example. But here are some examples that we learn about God's love. We learn that the human condition does not change it. No matter where we are in our hearts, God still loves you. The, our condition does not change it. From verse 38 through 39, we gain insight on God's love that is overwhelming and life-changing. Paul makes it clear that the human condition does not change God's love for you. You know, a close study of the book of Romans reveals a personal progression here for the apostle as he brings his doctrinal argument to the climax in verse 18, he says, for I reckon. In verse 28, he states, and we know. And in verse 38, he moves boldly to say, for I am persuaded. The reason for the apostle's boldness is that he knew God's love personally. His name was Paul. But if we look back in the scripture, his name was Saul. He was persecuting the Christians and he would meet Jesus on a Damascus road and Jesus could have destroyed him then and there, but Jesus loved him so much and spared his life that he would use him later in the ministry of, of God. When Paul says neither death nor life, he means that no condition between these two spectrums can turn God's love off. For you, isn't that something? The human condition does not change the fact that God loves you. God has never seen a person he did not love. From the worst of sinners to the greatest of saints, dead or alive, God loves us all. In this chapter, we learn uh, that God's love is incomparable. In verse third, in First John chapter three, verse one, it says, "Behold, what manner!" Now, in the Greek, the word "manner" in this verse is it gives a meaning of foreign, unique, or one of a kind. And one could say it literally could be translated, "What out of this world kind of love?" So, if we were to read that, would be, "Behold, what." out of this world kind of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God and therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not God loves you for who you are and he loves you and me the same God loves has love for you in this whole world we can all look at, we could, we could look at all the different relationships that you and I enjoy and all the various expressions of love that we say and have to those that we love. And yet the love of the, the love God of God is incomparable. Nothing can compare to the love of God. God's love is incomparable and it is out of this world. Why is that? A, because of its source. Well, what is the source of God's love? God is the source of it. God is love is what the scripture says. He is the source of it all. You know, it reminds me of when I was uh, younger, uh, you would go to your grandparents' house and they would, and people would say, uh, uh, which one of the children, we had, you know, four brothers or three brothers and sisters. And <clears throat> they would say, well, which one does your, your mom love the most? And you know, I'd stand up and be like it and smile. <laughs> she loved me. But see, God does not look at 
love that way. He loves us all. God doesn't say I love 6'2 more than I love Nancy or I love 6'2 more than I love any of his children. He loves us all for we are his children. B, God's love is incomparable and it is out of this world because of its scope. One of the most amazing things about the love of God is its extent. God has never known anyone that he didn't or doesn't love. One of the famous verses in the Bible is John chapter 3, verse 16, and I love it so much I say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life or eternal life. And the key word is for God so loved the world. Take the word world out and put your name there. For God so loved 6-2. For God so loved John. God loved you so much that it leads us to see God's love is incomparable and out of this world because of its sacrifice. Jesus was beaten for us. He hung on the cross for everyone in this room. He was buried, and on the third day, God's Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. For he's alive today because of the sacrifice that is 100% through Jesus Christ. Now I want to give you a little story, illustration. One evening in a country village, a cottage had caught on fire. In a few seconds, the roof and the timbers were ablaze. And there was no fire truck in, in, in sight. And the villagers stood helpless looking at this fire. And then suddenly a young man uh, burst out and said, what are you guys going to do? Stand there and be helpless and do nothing for those children in the house? This young, this young man ran through the front door, all the way through the back of the house, grabbed the children, put the children in his jacket, and ran out as he was, begin he was being burned. And he darted out of that house, and a moment later he emerged with the children under his arm. He had carefully hidden them in his coat to prevent, to prevent them from being burned. But he himself was burned badly. You know, the parents of these two children perished in the flames. There was much sympathy in the town and in the village that people would, would express their desire to, to adopt these two children. And then later, two people petitioned the court to adopt the children. One was the town mayor who had money, who could help these children, get them off to a, a nice school and get them off so that they could live a good life. And the other man who petitioned the court was a man who risked his life for them. And when the judge asked this man why the court should allow him to adopt the children, he did not answer with words. Instead, he held his hands high to bore the scars from the burns on his arms. He let those scars argue for him. What a great sacrifice. Yet, it does not compare with the love of God. God so loved us that he spared not his own son, but delivered him up. There are various ways that love can be shown, but none match the love of God in its sacrifice. Here's another thing that we learn in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39, two demons cannot restrain it. Demons cannot restrain the love of God. Not only does the human, the human condition cannot change it, but neither can demons restrain it. God loves you in the presence of the adversary. Paul says, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. Isn't that something? Well, who are the angels that he, are, that he's talking about here? He's talking about the fallen angels uh, the, who work in conjunction with the principalities and powers of this world against the believers who are in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is their work? They, they work to lure believers into sin through temptation. They work at causing Christians to fall so that in their fallen state, a believer feels unlovable and a sinner feels unsavable. Isn't that something? <coughs> 
The enemy is out to destroy your life. You know, looking in the scripture in Mark, Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, just thinking about demons cannot restrain it. Here, Jesus meets a man in the tombs who was tormented by demons, and he cared enough to save him, heal him, and deliver him, and use him for his glory. Isn't that something? God, no matter what, he was tormented. God loved him so much that he would deliver him from that torment while others would leave the man chained up alone. Here's some great news. When God decided to love you and me, not even the devil in hell could change God's mind about you. Here, we can see God's love is inseparable. Regardless of what we face and go through in our life, nothing we face is able to come between us and the love of God. His love will endure through anything at all. Do not get caught up in the things that make you make you feel that God does not love you or he's forsaking you because God has not. He loves you. He loves you and he's promised that he will be with you until the end of the age. Listen to the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 13, verse five. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that something when the devil says or the the demons say that God does not love you and he's left you alone? You could always go back to Hebrews 13 and says, get away from me, Satan. God is always with me no matter what I go through in life. And then in Matthew 28, 20, you claim this as well, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Amen. His promise is that nothing will be able to come between us and the Lord, our God. By the way, the word separate, it's a strong word. It carries the idea of a divorce or dividing asunder, regardless of what happens in life, nothing that man can do to you can come between you and what the Lord has for you in Jesus Christ. His love endures and makes us secure. You know, I, I think about that as I read it here. Uh, I, some things that I want you to know, Paul shares this great fact in us in this text this morning. A, that sin cannot separate us from his love. Sin cannot separate you from the love of God. He still, go, he still loves you regardless of what you've, do, you've done in life. Excuse me. I sure hope that don't turn my lips red. (laughs) Now, I want you to understand this this morning. Though God loves you, it does not give us an open thing to sin continually. We need to uh, understand, even though God loves us, no matter what we have done, sin has consequences, and we need to go to God every day. Paul shares his great facts in this text this morning that B, suffering cannot separate us from his love. Paul was a man who experienced uh, great suffering, yet his conclusion was that nothing could separate us from the love of God. He's been through it all. Paul has been through it all. And then we go, see, sickness cannot separate us from his love. You know, speaking of sickness, now I got this... Uh, I'll self-diagnose myself. You know how we are. You know, I got, I had bronchitis this week, I'll say. <laughs> it almost felt that way. But even though at times I felt that I could not breathe and I felt alone and no one wanted to get next to me because I was not feeling well, God was still there with me because he loves me. And no sickness, whether you're, you're living in a time where you have cancer or, or you're, you have, you're in, you have AIDS or something in your life that's uh, causing you to, to die slowly. I want you to understand today that God loves you and he is with you today. He is with you through the storm and nothing can separate that love between you and God. So give him praise and glory for that love that he gives for us and that he loves us so much this morning. <laughs> regardless of what we have done, how we look, 
or what we have suffered, God's love remains constant. You know, this week, Nancy, uh, I was sleeping and uh, had a dream. And in that dream, I remember dropping a plate of food and I was so hungry, trust me. <laughs> it landed on the rug and my sister and I were at the table and I went to go clean it and then the rug lifted up. And it started, it wrapped up, oh, I looked to the back to the, side, to, to the back, and I remember a door and all the water was coming in and it came in and it wrapped me up and it was suffocating me and I started pleading in the name and blood of Jesus Christ, Satan, get away from me. I was in a battle from the beginning to the end. I could remember the whole dream as if I could walk through it and live through it, but through it all, God loved me. Through it all, through the battles that I've had in the dreams or wherever I was, God's love was there. All I had to do was proclaim it. Satan, get behind me. And remind, and it reminded me <coughs> that no matter what I've done or where I've been in life, God loves me. And I woke up. And Nancy, I think she thought I was a priest in my dream or something because she said I was mumbling a lot of things there. But I was pleading for that love and that covering, and God did so. Which leads me to my final point. Here's a a final thing we learn from this chapter about God's love or the love of Christ. Time and dimensions cannot contain it. Time and dimensions cannot contain God's love. God loves you. God's love for you is so pronounced that time and dimension cannot contain it. Paul says, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any creature. (coughs) What he is saying is no present or future circumstances will keep God from loving you. In short, God loves you and there's nothing that you can do about it. The reason you cannot do anything about any, anything about it, it is that you had nothing to do with it. God loves you and you can't change that. God has made a decision to love you and his mind is made up. Nothing can turn the, his love off. Nothing can make his love cease and nothing will ever cause him not to love you deeply and personally. Here we learn that God's love is inescapable. His love is everlasting. You see, Paul closes this chapter by speaking of the confidence in his own security and those of, and in those of the redeemed. He tells us that we have, what we have is a, a, a not a hope so thing, but it's something that we can be confident in. He tells us that there is nothing from the beginning of our life with God until the end of our life here that we will, that will ever, that will be able to separate the believer from the salvation that he enjoys in Christ. The end result for all this is, is the blessed assurance that Jesus, that in Jesus we are forever protected and secure come what it may be, life or death. Everyone in this room must come face to face with the love of God. And what, and what he, in that love he has done and is doing for, for us. We cannot escape the presence nor the knowledge of this, his love. Why? A, God is present with you this morning in his love. You cannot escape the presence of God. Wherever you are, God is. Whatever you, if you try to hide under the pew, God's there. If you try to go to the bathroom and hide because you don't want to hear the sermon, God's there. <coughs> if you're going downstairs in the kitchen and you're saying we're finishing up, God is there. We cannot escape the love of God this morning. B, God is pursuing you this morning in his love. You know, one of the most beautiful scenes in the Bible, to me, is found in the very beginning. 
after the fall of Adam and Eve, they hid among the trees in the garden. Yet God came pursuing them. And the whole Bible is a story of the pursuit of God for fallen man. Isn't that something? God is in pursuit of you today. See, God is pleading with you this morning in his love. From God seeking fallen man in the book of Genesis, all the way through the scripture to the very last words, we see God in his love pleading with you and I to come to him to be saved. For the Bible says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let whom, him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Isn't that something? God loves you. You feel empty today. You feel alone today. God loves you no matter what. God loves you. And I want to conclude with this. Amen. I want to conclude. Does God love us is the question. And here's your answer. Yes, he does. And today, we're going to be able to come together and be reminded of that love that Christ had done for us as we come together and partake of the Lord's Supper today. And as I, we, we make, as the deacons make their way forward, we're just reminded of that great love that we're never alone no matter what we've done or what's gone in our life. And we're reminded that God loves you and me. So you can repeat after me this morning, God loves me. God loves me. Amen.